In this video, we're going to discuss the two-dimensional particle in the box. So we've already discussed the one-dimensional particle in the box. We introduced this wave function, its energy uh, values, talked about its energy levels. Um, so you've, you've already had an introduction to the particle in the box problem in one dimension. However, what happens when we introduce another dimension? What happens when we have a two-dimensional box and a particle that, that can move in two directions? Well, it's going to change our, um, our Schrodinger's equation just a little bit. So we're going to have a different wave function, energy level. Anytime you add a, a different dimension, those have to, that has to be taken into account, right? So, um, so this is a schematic of the new problem that we're looking at, the two-dimensional particle in a box, right? We've got our particle of mass m that's free to move in two directions, the x and the y direction. And it's inside of a box that is surrounded by a two-dimensional infinite potential, right? So this uh, potential is a function of x and y. It covers all of the space surrounding the particle in the x and y direction. And the horizontal space I'm going to call uh, L1 and the vertical space I'm going to call L2. So we got two different lengths of this box that we have to consider, right? So this is going to change our Schrodinger's equation a little bit, right? So our time independent Schrodinger's equation will look like the following, right? So we'll have h bar squared, negative h bar squared over 2m, right? As our uh, constants out front of the kinetic energy term. But now the kinetic energy operator has to operate on the x and the y direction for the wave function, right? So we have to have the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x, plus the second derivative of the wave function with respect to y, right? So that changes a little bit, right? Now we, we have, it's the same kinetic energy operator, but now it's operating on two dimensions, right? X and Y. And obviously on the right-hand side, that will give us our energy and our wave function, right? But the key thing here is that now our wave function is also a function of X and Y, right? So that means that this is no longer just a one dimensional differential equation. We have two dimensions that we have to consider. So what do we do? Do we throw our hands up and just say we can't solve that? Of course not. We don't do that. Right. So what we want to do here is try a trick that's called separation of variables. This first thing that we're going to try is a trick called separation of variables. And anytime you have a um, multi-dimensional differential equation like this, this is the first thing you want to try. Um, the essential characteristic of, of separation of variables is that you're basically going to do what it says. You're going to try to separate the variables into a, a function of X and a function of Y and see if you can separate out differential equation. Because if you can, then you can, can, you can treat those separated differential equations as just one dimensional differential equations. So let's let's work through it and I'm, I promise you it'll make more sense. Just like you would in calculus if you have a three dimensional integral, you split it up into multiple 1D integrals. It's the same thing here. So let's, let's get into it. So we have a, a wave function as a function of X and Y. In order to separate the variables, we're gonna assume that this wave function, that is a two dimensional wave function, can be written as a product of two one dimensional wave functions. So I'm gonna have a, a function X, that is a function of x, so big X and little x, and a function big Y, that's a function of y, right? So I'm assuming that I can separate this function into the product of two functions, one that depends on x and one that depends on y. So that is going to have a profound effect on our differentiation, right? So we can rewrite those derivatives in the following way. Basically, what we're going to do is uh, rewrite these derivatives by plugging in our new product of functions, right? So we can rewrite this second derivative of psi with respect to x, right? Now we're going to have d squared, right? We got our x, our function x times our function y dx. Right. But now, since we've uh, made it where X is a function of X and Y is only a function of Y, we can actually factor out Y out of this derivative because it's only a function of Y. So this derivative isn't going to touch it. So you're going to have Y on the outside. And then you just have the second derivative of the function X DX squared. Right now, I'm trying to make these X's as different as possible. This X is this function X 
and then the little x is our variable x, right? So you can pull that y out of the derivative so that it's um, so that it's just out, outside since it doesn't depend on x. And we can do the exact same thing with the other derivative, right? We got the second derivative of the wave function with respect to y, right? Again, now that's a derivative of our function x and our function y with respect to y. And so we can do the same thing. We can yank out x, and then this is just the second derivative with respect to y. Right, so we can rewrite those derivatives in that way. So now that we've rewritten these derivatives, let's rewrite our Schrodinger's equation, right? So I'm gonna rewrite our time-independent Schrodinger's equation, T-I-S-E. Right, so rewriting that guy, um, we'll have negative h bar squared over 2m, and then on the inside, we'll have our x function, d, uh, second derivative of x. Oh, it's actually, this one's first. The one with respect to y is first. So it wouldn't matter since it's a sum, but I just want to stay consistent here. All right, plus x, y dy, right? So basically all we did here was rewrite this Schrodinger's equation such that, oh, and let me actually use um, x and y on this side as well, since we're replacing this wave function completely, right? So we got e times x times y, right? So we've substituted our, um, our separated functions, right? We substituted them in, we got these derivatives. Now the point of separated, so separation of variables is to show that you can separate the variables in the actual differential equation itself, right? Which we have not done yet. So we have these mixed terms where we have y and x in the same term, and we also ha here have x and y in the same term. But what we can do is do some algebra here, and we can actually divide by one over x times y on both sides. And if we do that, we actually, um, successfully separate our variables. So let me show you. So h squared over 2m, right? If we're, if we're dividing by x times y, right, then that's going to cancel out this y. So we end up with 1 over x d squared x dx squared plus 1 over y, our function y, d squared y over dy squared is equal to the energy, right? So what we've done here is we've shown that we can actually separate the variables, right? So we've, we just divided by, um, so you can think about this as dividing by x times y or multiplying by one over x times y, right? If you multiply by one over x times y on both sides, then this is your result, right? The uh, y cancels out here, you're left with one over x, and here the x cancels out, you're left with one over y. Now we have this term only depends on y, and this term only depends on x, right? So let me actually uh, write that down, right? So this, is, this term is now independent of y, and then this term is independent of x. Right, so we've proven that we can separate the variables. Now, one thing to note about this equation is that with on the left-hand side, the sum of these two terms, right, these two differentials, they sum up to equal a constant, right? The energy is a is a is an eigenvalue. It's just a number, right? So if these two equal up to form to to sum up to a number, this implies that there is an x component to our energy, right? Plus some y component to our energy that will yield our total energy, right? There must be some uh, contribution here that is a constant plus some contribution from this term, also a constant um, that equals up to give us our total energy, right? So um, let me rearrange this expression a little bit and, and kind of make this a little bit more explicit. So if we move all of the constants over to the other side, then we get the following expression. We'll have one over 
our function x, d squared x, dx squared plus one over our function y, d squared y or second derivative of y, y squared. So then if we, so if we move all the constants over, then we got negative two m e over h bar squared. Right. So really what we can do here, if we know that there's, um, you know, an X component plus a Y component that sum up to equal our total energy, then we can actually break this equation down into two. Right. So we're going to break this into two separate equations where we've got one over X. D squared X. DX squared equal to. Negative two M E x over h bar squared so see what i did there right so we're just this is only the x component so we know that this component of the equation is going to give us our x contribution to the total energy right and then the same thing for our y component right so on this side we have one over y second derivative of y with respect to y it's equal to negative 2m e y over h bar squared, right? So we got a, 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 an equation that'll give us our x component to the energy and an equation that'll give us our y component to the energy. So let's do a little bit more algebra and I think something should become apparent to you once you see it. So h bar squared over 2m x over dx squared is equal to ex times x and i can do the same type of rearrangement here with the y component as well right over 2m e squared y or a second derivative of y with respect to y is equal to e sub y times y right so what do you notice here right we got two equations here if you look closely you'll notice that these are one dimensional particle in the box equations right it, the only thing that's different here is that the eigenfunction is y or x instead of psi but these are just 1d particle in the box equations right so these are one dimensional particle in the box equations and so what does that mean for us that means that the one dimensional particle in the box wave functions that we already solved for will actually serve as solutions to each of these one dimensional particle in the box equations right so let's do it so so this x we know that the x here its solution so we'll say that it's going to be uh dependent on a quantum number n one so i want to make sure that these quantum numbers are labeled differently so this will be n sub one we know that x is just a function of x so we're going to have two over l one the square root of two over l one sine n1 pi x over l1 right so keep in mind just so just to refresh right our box uh, the x direction was constrained from 0 to l1 y direction is going to be from 0 to l2 so when we write out our um, solution for the y function here going to use a different quantum number n2 you know this is a function of y so we'll have 2 over l2 all right, square root of 2 over L2 sine N2 pi Y L2. Right, so basically look at what we've done, right? These are just one dimensional particle in the box equations. Basically what we're able to do is break this up into two different uh, particle in the box problems, right? This, this axis and this axis. And then we're just going to jam them together to get the 2D wave function. So our wave function for the two dimensional particle in the box, let me go back to the previous slide, right? Remember that we, we were breaking our wave function up so that it was a product of a function that only depended on X and a function that only depended on Y. Well, we were able to solve for that function that only depended on X and the function that depended on Y. The last thing to do is just multiply them together. So that's what we're going to do in this final step is just multiply everything together. So, the wave function for the 2D particle in the box, it depends on a quantum number N1 and a quantum number N2. 
and it is a function of X and Y. And so when we put everything together here, we can uh, kind of combine this uh, normalization factor so that it can read two over square root L1 times L2, right? That's if you just put those, uh, those normalization constants together, right? And then you just put the trig functions out front. N1 pi X over L1 sine N2 pi Y over L2, right? So that's gonna be your wave function for the two dimensional particle in the box. And as far as the energy levels, now if the product, if the uh, wave function is a product of two functions, right? A product of two one dimensional particle in the box wave functions, then the energy is actually gonna be a sum of two particle in the box energies. So for this problem, let me actually use a different color. For the energy levels, the energy levels as with the wave functions are gonna depend on two quantum numbers, N1 and N2. And basically we'll have N1 squared over L1 squared plus N2 squared over L2 squared. Right, that's gonna be times H squared over 8M. Right, so basically this is a sum of two particle in the box energies. Right, so went through all that to show and introduce uh, separation of variables. Also, this kind of gives you, um, you know, that the 2D particle in the box is just a, the wave function is just a product of two one dimensional particle in the box wave functions. And for the energy levels, it's just a sum of two particle in the box uh, energies, right? So I would challenge you, what would the three dimensional particle in the box look like, right? It's gonna be a, a product of three one dimensional particle in the box energies, a particle in the box wave functions, and the energy levels would just be a sum of three particle in the box energies, right? It, it expands to that third dimension. So I challenge you to try to see if you can write out the form of the three dimensional particle in the box, just knowing that information.